Dear friends in Christ, may God pour out His love and His mercies on you new each morning. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we give thanks to you for sending us Christ our King, who is the King who rules this world, the King who rules eternity. May we each day trust in Him and, and confess our faith in Him. Lord, may you lead us always in our lives that we live, in the ways that we speak, and in the words that we share, that people may know that you are King of our lives and King of our hearts, that you are King and you are coming again. May this, be our, may this be the assurance of our lives now and forever. Amen. About two days ago, okay, exactly two days ago, uh, it, we celebrated or remembered, probably not celebrated, the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, also better known as JFK. He was the 35th president of the United States, and many people, as was attributed by History Channel, Discovery Channel, and pretty much every channel two days ago, to the impact he had on our world, on our lives. He has been held up and idealized and idolized by many. He's been looked at as a, a great leader of our country, one who died too young, one who had great charisma, great charm. He had brought us nearly to the brink of war, but he was the one to do it. He stood up and he said, Ich bin ein Berliner, which if your German is any good, he actually said, I'm a jelly donut, but uh, at that time he was speaking for support for West Berlin. But you think that John F. Kennedy, JFK, and you think about the people in our lives who are idolized, those people who are put up on a pedestal, those people who we adore, who we look at with wonder and awe. Many times it's a president's name. Many people say George Washington or some of the early ones, Abraham Lincoln as he led the people through the Civil War and through, through the various trials that followed. When you think about it, even our current president, many people idolize. He stood on a platform of hope when he entered into the White House. And many people looked to that hope because that's what they needed at that time. Now, I'll let you be the judge of how well he's doing. That's not what this pulpit's for. But we know that many people, maybe some of us, will idolize various presidents, various figures. How about you? Who do you idolize? Is there someone in your life that stands up above all others? Someone who that you look at and you really put up on a pedestal? Sometimes it can be a spouse, maybe it's some, a, a husband or a wife who you look at and you think, wow, they are amazing. Maybe you even say they can do no wrong, although I'd like to meet you because that's not how it is in my marriage, but there's no perfection this side of eternity. Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your grandparents. You look at how they lived, how they, the example that they set, the way that they lived in their lives. Maybe it's clergy. Many people, they come and go from churches because of various pastors. Maybe it is a president. But when you think about it, why do those people, why do you idolize them? Why do you hold them up? Because as we look at these people, we know that they're going to let us down. We know that on this side of eternity, that always the same thing happens. There are imperfections in these people. Even though we hold them up for what they do, for the honors they have, they let us down. They fail us, and eventually they die. Think about it. How many politicians have you idolized? Have you held up and said, they are the great hope, and they were not such a great hope? How many clergies have you heard about, uh, clergy members have you heard about in various scandals? Family members who have let you down time and again. You know, oftentimes, we have these people that we idolize, that we hold up, but they fail us. They fail to live up to what we expect what we desire. And I wondered why. Why do we? Why do we put these people before we, the one who we know will never fail us? Why do we put these people before Christ, our King? Why do we fail to see the King in the way that He is working and living in our lives today? Why are we so blind? Well, maybe it's because of what we see in our world today. Last week you heard texts about from, from Luke chapter 20 and 21 and you heard about the ways that the end times were going to, wars and rumors of wars, that, uh, that it won't even be good for a pregnant woman at that time. And there's this great fear at the end of times. There's this great fear because we look around us today and we hear about hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people losing their lives. We hear about these constant scandals. We hear about these constant wars and these con this con these con this constant hate around us. And all these things that seem to be falling apart. And we fail to see our king. We fail to see the king acting in this world today. And so we put up these other idols. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a thing. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's power. Maybe it's just ourselves. 
Think about it for just a minute. Why did idols take the place of Christ? It's because of where we stand in our fears and our hearts. It's because we don't see the King reigning today. Because we don't see the King who promised to be here never to leave us nor forsake us. So many times, Christians and non-Christians alike, this is what they struggle with. They struggle with all the things that are out of control in our world today. They struggle with the fact that there is nothing they can do to stop it. Or they feel helpless to stop it. And so these idols take the place because they promise something better. Maybe something more hopeful. Something more concrete. But that is all they are. Much like the Old Testament idols that let people down. That's what the idols that we have today are. Now Paul, he addressed this in Colossians. Because the people of Colossae, the church of Colossae, they had a huge problem going on. And it wasn't just one small problem. It was all over the place. They had all sorts of false teachers who were coming to them and pointing them to idols. Sometimes those idols were themselves. They had this idea of asceticism, that they, if they stripped down all their, their physical needs and, and they ate as little as they could and drank as little as they could and they had very little for earthly goods, well, that would make them more ripe for salvation. Some of them thought that great wisdom and great knowledge could help them. They even followed this, this false heresy called Gnosticism, coming from the Greek word gnosis. They thought that there was a secret knowledge to come to God. Some of them, they worshipped angels. There was a, 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 a little uh, lie that was going around during that time, uh, a myth that St. Michael had come down and he had blessed, specially blessed Colossae. Well, that was a false rumor. But many people, they put their faith in angels instead of Christ. And so Paul, he writes this book of Colossians. He writes this book for those people then and the, for us today to remind us of just who Christ is. Christ the King. Christ the Supreme. And I want you to turn right now with me to your bulletins, to page 6 at the top. Right there is what we're going to read because I want you to listen to the words that Paul uses to describe Christ here. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all this fullness dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile Himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Wow. You just, as you read those words, as you listen to those words, you think about what it means to say that we confess Christ as Lord. He is the one who created our earth. He is the one who holds it together, the Almighty One. He is the one that is reigning even this day, when, even when we don't see Him. He is the one who cares for us and loves us. He is the one who has made peace for us at the cross. He is the one who has brought all things, who will one day destroy all things and make all things new. He is the one who is not merely the one that we love, but we worship. And our worship is not a one-a-day thing, once-a-week thing. It's an all-day, everyday thing. Our worship of Christ comes out in the way that we live our lives, the way that we treat one another, what we teach our children and our grandchildren. Our worship to God comes out in the ways that we forgive one another, the ways that we let go of anger and grudges, the ways that we share Jesus' love to those who we don't feel deserve it. The way that we talk to those who we, who are marginalized by society. Those who have let us down. So that's who, how we worship our King. Oh, sure. Coming into His house on a Sunday morning. Yes, what a blessing we have to do that. But our worship extends far beyond that. Our worship goes out into all places. But so often... Our worship is constrained. So often, this is where our worship stops. Our worship stops here. And our worship is meant to go further. Our worship seems to, to stop here because our, in the world, Christ is divorced from the world. We don't see Him acting. But He is. He didn't just ascend to His throne on high, leave us here to hope and to pray, 
but He is with us each and every day. He stands beside us. He goes with us. As He promised, as He promised in Matthew, He will not leave us nor forsake us. He will be with us in all that we go through, through every trial, through every tribulation. He will walk through us when the times seem to be anti-Christian, when the world seems to be against our faith and against Christ Himself. He will be there to stand strong right in front of us as the one who goes before us. He is our king and our leader. He is the one. But he's a different king. He's a king who doesn't reign like any other. In fact, when he, when he came to this earth, as I said to the kids, he didn't put on a crown. He didn't have people bow down before him. He didn't call them his subjects. He called them his friends. He calls us his friends. In fact, he... He exchanged his heavenly robes. He, he threw those off. And exchanged those for bruises. For blood running from his head, from his side. He exchanged his crown, his crown of glory, with the crown of thorns. He exchanged his perfect life that he lived, his righteousness for our sinful lives. He came down from heaven and he looked at us just like the thief on the cross. Naked, filthy, reeking of our sin, broken by our sinfulness. And He clothed us with His crown of glory. He clothed us with His robe of righteousness. He crowned us with His crown of glory and He gave us that gift of forgiveness. He gave us that gift of life. He took away our sin and washed us and made us clean. He bound our wounds together and then He put that robe upon us and called us His sons and his daughters. And he gave us the promise of an inheritance, one greater than we can ever imagine. An inheritance that, that can barely be described by Paul in Galatians, but he talks about that movement that we have, no longer slaves to our sins, no longer slaves to the brokenness of the world, but sons and daughters of the king. Paul talks about this to the people of Galatia. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are His child, God has made you an heir. We are the children, the heirs of God. We have been promised not a kingdom here on earth, but we have been promised the greatest kingdom of all. Our King, Christ Jesus, has promised the kingdom of glory, the kingdom that, of being with Him forever in heaven, the kingdom of eternal life. And so, yeah, indeed, we will walk each day. We will walk this life with trials and tribulations. At times, it will be hard to see Christ walking with us. At times, it will be scary. At times, it will, be hurt. It will hurt. At times, fear will overcome us. But in all those times, Christ walks with us. In all those times, we have the promise that Christ is coming again. Not as a baby in Bethlehem. Not meek and mild. Not subject, put under subjugation of the cross. But coming in all His glory, all His power, and all His honor. Coming to redeem those He calls His sons and daughters. Coming to call us home to be with Him. And so in all things, as we pray to our Lord, as we come to Him, we, saw, we say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we live in a world that is broken by sin and death. We live lives that, have been, that are oftentimes far from You, that fail to honor You. Lord, at times, even... We put others before you. We idolize people and things. Sometimes because they're more concrete. Forgive us for those things. Forgive us for putting others first and remind us every day that as we repent to you, as we come before you, that your forgiveness is new each morning. Remind us, Lord, that you are king over all. That you are not a king who will let us down, a king who will fail us, a king that will forget us, but a king who is with us forever. Lord, we pray that in our lives that we live, that we might honor you, that we might praise your name, that we might share your word. Lord, we pray that all may come to know you, that all may call you king, and that all may crown you with many crowns. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.